कुंज Prabhupad <laughs> Shishi Radha Krishna Gopika Banasham Kun Radha Kun Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Frinda Vandam Ki Jai Navadhan Ki Jai Ganga Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Tulsi Maharani Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Samaveta Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai All glories to the symbol devotees All glories to the symbol devotees All glories to the symbol devotees All glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga Om Nama Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So where's Tyler soul? Oh, he's cooking breakfast? Dimitri? I don't know where Dimitri went. And then we know where the others are. Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, The Creative Impetus, Chapter 17, The Descent of the River Ganges, Text 17. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Om Namo Bhagavate Maha Purushaya Sarvaguna Sankhyanaya Sankhyanayana Thaya Vyaktaya Nama Iti Translation, Commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The most powerful Lord Shiva says, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you in your expansion as Lord Sankarshan. You are the reservoir of all transcendental qualities. Although you are unlimited, you remain unmanifest to the non-devotees. 18. O my Lord, you are the only worshipable person, for you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the reservoir of all opulences. Your secure lotus feet are the only source of protection for all your devotees. Whom you satisfy by manifesting yourself in various forms. O oh my Lord, you deliver your devotees from the clutches of material existence. 
Non-devotees, however, remain un entangled in material existence by your will. Kindly accept me as your eternal servant. We cannot control, 19, we cannot control the force of our anger. Therefore, when we look at material things, we cannot avoid feeling attraction or repulsion for them. But the Supreme Lord is never affected in this way. Although he glances over the material world for the purpose of creating, maintaining, and destroying it, he is not affected, even to the lightest, slightest degree. Therefore, one who desires to conquer the force of the senses must take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Then he'll be victorious. Purport, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is always equipped with inconceivable potencies. Although creation takes place by his glancing over the material energy, he is not affected by the modes of nature because of his eternally transcendental position. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears in this material world, the modes of material nature cannot affect him. Therefore, the Supreme Lord is called transcendence. And anyone who wants to secure from the influence Anyone who wants to be secure from the influence of the modes of material nature must take shelter of him. Oh my God, it's in this, yeah. Kananjana Shlakya Chakshulan Malita Mina Tasma Shi Gurvenam Ha Bukam Kariti Vacha Man Bangam Langa Tegadim Nikripa Tamaham Bande Shi Gurun Dinitaranam Pancha Kopadri Bishta Kripa Sindhavi Vicha Patita Nam Pavani Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namana Maha Jaya Shi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasri Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. So Lord Shiva is praying here in this particular uh, section of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he's mentioning in this last verse, well, first of all, um, you remain un unmanifest to the non-devotees. So this is text 17. So the non-devotees, they can't, they cannot, um, they cannot perceive the value of Krishna consciousness. And, in a, and a lot of the times they think, they think the devotees are insane. Uh, they think the devotees are wasting their time. Just like from a material, actually from a material standpoint, everything the devotees do are just one, it's one big waste of time. Just like, I guess from the material standpoint, they could say, well, at least you're, <laughs> they'll say that if you sing, because there's something like some scientific uh, you know, they're always investigating all different types of things, right? Scientific things. But they say, okay, you sing with others. That produces some whatever endorphins or something. You feel happy, right? So although the non-devotees would say Krishna is an absolute imagination and he doesn't exist, but at least maybe they could say you're... you're uh, you're getting the endorphins fire, f you're firing some endorphins, you know, so you're feeling a little happy. Or they'll say, oh, your deity worship is a complete waste of time, right? Which is interesting to think about because devotees just that, I mean, they say nitya seva, it's like et eternal seva, but the devotees could be real, it, it's actually quite engaging. And a lot of temples that I've visited, actually all of them, <laughs> They're all like struggling to to um, to um, perform the deity worship to a standard that Srila Prabhupada wanted. 
because practically it's an all-day affair. Like Prabhupada would say, oh, the devotees are busy from 4 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. at night. And it's an all-day affair. And nowadays everybody, you know, the modern civilization has got everybody um, working very hard to the point that devotees sometimes in these congregations, they feel, I'm working so hard and I'm so tired that... Um, they don't feel inspiration to come to the temple and do deity worship um, or cooking or anything involved because they're just so tired. And also modern civilization ha has people working like really into advanced age, actually. I mean, Vedic civilization says 50, stop. <laughs> stop working when you're 50. I mean, how many devotees are doing that? I don't know any in America. I mean, unless they got some inheritance or something like that, but they're working it till 65, 70, I mean, and they're just tired. <laughs> yeah, not just devotees, non-devotees, everybody. So, um, so it's a bit of a challenge. And all the brahmacharis, they're supposed to go out and preach. And all the householders are too working too hard to do the deity worship, so I'm not sure how that's supposed to work out, but anyways, it's working out to a degree, more or less, in different places, but um, the non-devotees would say, whatever the case is, the non-devotees would say, oh, deity worship is just a waste of time. Um, but um, why? Because they can't perceive, they cannot understand um, the, 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 the value of Krishna consciousness. And similarly, um, to the degree that one remains or that the one is I in a state of ignorance, um, they also cannot perceive. That means just because one becomes a follower of ISKCON or initiated devotee within ISKCON, doesn't mean they automatically understand the, the value of Krishna consciousness. And many times, over time, unfortunately, um, you know, like you see somebody when they join, they're like, <laughs> like you know, they're very enthusiastic, you know, they're blazing tilak, Fresh, I'm talking about they joined the ashram. Blazing tilak, fresh bald head. <laughs> um, everything's just, they're just really enthusiastic. On fire, right? And then over time, it's kind of like, you know, they get first initiation, they get second initiation, they kind of, over time, and they just become not on fire. You know, they kind of cool down and just kind of, um, now, of course, that doesn't have to be the case, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, one can remain enthusiastic perpetually and become more and more enthusiastic. That's the idea. Um, but sometimes, but sometimes that's the case. And I, I remember <laughs> David Mita Swami was saying he was in Mayapur, and uh, you know, during the morning announcements, <laughs> the. the the uh, announcer, he said, okay, then we're going on Harinam. And uh, there's a, some young new bhakta in the audience, you know. Jai! You know, it's like, um, but, you know, sometimes you kind of, oh, Harinam, or whatever it is, we're going to book distribution Harinam, and it's kind of like, eh, uh, maybe, maybe not, or not so enthusiastic about it, or, you know. So, um, so that could be the case, too, that unfortunately we also could become covered over time, even though in the association of devotees where we're not seeing the value of Krishna consciousness. And that's why Srila Prabhupada said that we have to remain alive, meaning very serious hearing and chanting about Krishna. And then um, deity worship, book distribution, Harinam, all these different things that Prabhupada want us to do, they won't, they won't be seen at all as a, 
as a chore, as a boring thing, as a thing that, okay, I need to get this done as soon as possible so I could go back to sleep or so I could eat something or so I, so I could whatever, you know, do this or that. Um, but it will be seen as something that we actually like to do and we actually um, cannot live without. Um, so yeah. Now in the next verse, um, it's saying that your lotus feet, your secure lotus feet are the only source of protection for all your devotees, whom you satisfy by manifesting yourself manifesting yourself in various forms. Oh my Lord, you deliver your, your devotees from the clutches of material existence. Non-devotees have remained entangled in material existence by your will. Kindly accept me as your eternal servant. So our source of protection is, is um, Krishna, Krishna's lotus feet. And we shouldn't take shelter in anything else. We shouldn't take shelter in... There's so many things to take shelter in this world. And people are trying to uh, take shelter of so many different things. But a devotee takes shelter in Krishna. They take shelter in the process of devotional service. Um, that's their only shelter. But the non-devotees, they remain entangled in material existence by your will. So what does that mean, by your will? It's referring to Krishna's will. So is it Krishna's will? that he wants all, everyone just to remain entangled. It means that he's fulfilling the desires of the entities, living entities, to say, fine, if you want to forget me, okay, fine. Um, forget me. And I'll help you do that. Um, right? What is it? Apohanamcha. Matasmitir gyanam apohanam cha. The Bhagavad Gita. Sarvasicha hamridi sandavishto matasmitir gyanam apohanam cha. That Krishna gives remembrance and forgetfulness. Um, and that's based on our desire. So it's not Krishna's ultimate desire that we, we remain entangled, but if it's our desire, then he'll facilitate that. Um, even while in a temple, if it's our desire to forget Krishna, then he'll facilitate that as well. <laughs> which is which is interesting because it's like the temple, we're living in a Hare Krishna temple, or we're living close by a Hare Krishna temple, and you look around and all you see is Krishna. <laughs> you see Krishna, pictures everywhere. You see, you hear in Kirtan all the time, right? You're seeing devotees all the time. But if we, if we want to forget Krishna, then to to d different degrees, then he'll allow that. Um, of course, in the temple and anywhere, we should try to cultivate the desire of, remem of, of wanting to remember Krishna. That's what we need to do. So Lord Shiva is saying, kindly accept me as your servant. Um, and he's also mentioning the force of anger. So this force of anger, it is a sh very powerful force in this world and destroys relationships, destor destroys health, destroys um, lives, right? People go to prison, so many things, anger. Uh, and therefore Rupa Goswami says, Vacho vegam manasa kroda vegam jiva vegam madarapasta vegam etan vegam yo vishaheta dira sarvam epimam prativim shishishya. Now he's given the qualifications of a guru, vacho vegam manasakroda vegam. So the guru has controlled the forces of anger, the tongue, belly, genitals, mind, um, speech. So they've mastered these urges. They've controlled them. And therefore they can make disciples all over the world. Um, but as disciples, we're also meant to control these. Um, anger is one of them. Of course, anger can be used in Krishna's service as well, just like the two famous devotees, Hanuman and uh, Arjun. He, uh, Hanuman burned all of Lanka. 
In Arjun, he right, fought the battlefield of Kurukshetra. You have to be angry to fight. But Srila Prabhupada said, when someone is blaspheming of us, blaspheming us, we should be tolerant. But if they're blaspheming the devotees or Krishna, then we could act like fire. That's what he said. So, but anger is a, um, again, a thing that needs to be controlled. And especially anger towards devotees, one devotee to another. Sometimes devotees may argue <laughs> about very interesting things <laughs> that no one else on the planet would argue about. Um, like there's a lot of, in the realm of deity worship, there's so many details, actually. There's a lot. And uh, sometimes devotees disagree on them and spend have long conversations about the different details. But Srila Prabhupada said, just keep it simple. You know, it's not the process for this age. It is a process, one of the five most potent forms, but it's not the process. The process is Hari Nam, Chen and Hari Kushan. But it's amazing how many, how much sometimes the Pujaris get involved in so many details, you know. You know, they asked Prabhupada one time about fire yagya, for example. Because devotees want to know, oh, what do you do? You know, you light this stick first, light that stick first, chant this mantra first. And this devotee said that, that devotee said this. And devotees could get really worked up about a lot of the details. So then Sh Sh they asked Srila Prabhupada, what do we do, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada, I think he put his hand like this. And he leaned towards the devotee and he said, shortcut which means just keep it simple that was Prabhupada's um, so so yeah it could be um, so anger could develop from that well I want it done this way oh well I want it done this way okay well let's disagree about it let's fight about it um, just like also Nanda Kumar Prabhu was in Juhu and he was going to serve Srila Prabhupada's breakfast and then he was walking through the ashram and he heard he overheard some devotees speaking. And the and the devotees I brought this up some time ago, but the devotees were saying Prabhupada said we should have seven chickpeas every morning. And another devotee said, Well, I'm in LA and they said we should have eleven. And someone else said, Oh, we should have fourteen, right? So there's a that's what I'm saying, devotees discuss and argue very interesting about very interesting things. <laughs> no one else on the planet would even think about that. But so then Nanda Kumar told Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada said, Oh, they're saying I said so many things. But he said that you should just accept what you hear from me personally or what you read in my books. And he said, as far as chickpeas are concerned, you should take as many as you could digest. So he didn't say a particular amount of chickpeas. Um, so devotees could disagree, and these are small things, there's other things, um, about so many things, and become angry. And this anger could lead towards further uh, reactions, such as yelling, screaming, <laughs> spitting, <laughs> um, using foul language, and the last one is, you know, clenching of the fist and then punching or kicking or something like that. And this isn't good because um, we're not supposed to do any of that actually with the devotees. So, so then the question is, okay, well, how do we overcome this anger? Um, well, one thing is we have to become uh, dira, which means de uh, like we're just a savacho vegam manasokro de vegam jiva vegam matada basta vegam etan vegam yovesha heta dira, sober. We have to become sober. And what does it mean to be sober? It means that we're not disturbed, or we may be disturbed, but we control it. And 
this ability to do that um, is only possible by um, us becoming free of material desires, right? Because we become angry when people don't act uh, according to our liking. In other words, we have like material desires. We have, you could say, particular desires, how we think people should act or how people should treat us. Or like I remember one time I was, anyways, I was with one devotee and um, we were going from Vrindavan to Delhi and there was another devotee and I don't have to say his, you know, whatever details about him but anyways uh, <laughs> I was with a few brahmacharis in the back and there was this devotee in front we didn't really know him and uh, when we got out of the taxi one of the brahmacharis mentioned to this devotee that okay let's split the cost here you know because um, you know we're all riding together and is if we split the cost, then it's not going to be that much, and it's not that big of a deal, and let's just split the cost. It's a normal thing, you split the cost. So this Brahmacharya was asking this other devotee, it was a Brahmacharya also, and, um, and this other devotee got really upset. <laughs> he like, got really angry and really frustrated, and he just said, no, I'm, I'm not splitting the cost. And he, he was kind of like, you know, do you know who I am and, you know, type of thing. And he said, Gopal Krishna Goswami called me here personally to meet with me. And he got really, <laughs> and he just kind of stormed away. <laughs> and uh, I mean, whatever. I mean, with the brahmacharis I was with, some of them were more disturbed and, than, than others. But it, it was interesting, actually, to see that. Um. But it's, in other words, it's, a, it's this devotee who didn't want to pay. He was, he was angry based on us, you know, asking for him, asking him to help with the taxi ride. And based on us not really treating him as he wanted to be treated. Maybe you could say in a special way. Um, so you could say it's material desire. And he became angry. Now, if he didn't have any you know, particular desires or expectations on how he wanted to be treated, then he would have said, okay, yeah, sure, I'll you know, help with a donation. Or maybe he would have been a little disturbed by, oh, you're not recognizing my special position or something, but okay, I'll still help you out or something. But, but it wouldn't be, would have, he wouldn't have made it into a whole episode. And many people are like that. I mean, people, I mean, people shoot people on the basis of how they look at them. I mean, you look at somebody in the wrong part of town in a wrong way, and they'll at least, they may th at least threaten you with a gun. And if you continue, they may shoot you. So you could say it's a material desires that, hey, this guy shouldn't be looking at me like this. I'm a special guy here. And then and then if you continue to do something, then they may pull out a gun and shoot you. So, and that's just a few examples. I mean, there's so many examples of people having material desires and just losing their temper over it, not being treated properly. Um, so if we don't have any expectations, in other words, if we're humble <laughs> and if we're tolerant, then we could, we could just be tolerant and... It doesn't really matter, you know, how people treat us or this and that. In other words, we can control our anger. Um, so, and if we do desire to control the forces of the senses, then we must take shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Then we'll be victorious. So Krishna is in a transcendental position, and his devotees, um, they also are. They're, to the degree they take shelter, to the degree they're free. Um, yeah. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes.
Okay, you said there were degrees of forgetting, even if you're living at the temple or living next door. Uh, yes. What can they be, those degrees, because they're real subtle and little, and, you know, they're, there's a surfboard waiting for me, you know, like, where I'm moving into, and <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, the right. different degrees of forgetting and losing your taste to you know chant away and you know be here a lot and yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, there's. I mean, the. All right, Krishna. Welcome, Shukri. Shukri Das, Shukri Krishna Das. What does Shukri mean again? Oh, the grateful. Okay, so it could be Shukri Krishna Das. Because Krishna is actually grateful. Shukri Krishna Das. Um, servant of the grateful Krishna. So, well, I mean, there's, you could say, because there's like Krishna consciousness, right? Consciousness of Krishna. And then there's, sometimes fallen into illusion. Whereas Prabhupada says, okay, we're in illusion, but sometimes we fall into Krishna consciousness, right? But if you want to look at it as we're in Krishna consciousness for the most of the part, hopefully, and then we fall into illusion, then there's different, um, different ways we could fall into illusion. You could say, like one way is, I don't know, maybe somebody says something to us and we have an urge to like... Uh, say something sharp back to them and then we become angry and say something sharp back to them that's a, that's we failed the test um and you know to say oh well we all have different personalities and and this is just one of my problems and this and that well it's failing the test whether it's your personality or whether it's you know we all have problems it's a failure um means the person's not a failure, but it's as a test that's presented and then failing the test means we shouldn't speak unnecessarily harshly with devotees uh, or we'll lose our temper. Um, <clears throat> so there's that, or there's... Um, there, anyway, there's so many different things. Um, so many different ways. So we just become a little derailed, sidetracked. And there's so many different ways to do that, whether it's th this attachment, that attachment, so many different ways. So the idea is we want to become always fixed, whereas we don't waver. So we're, so we're always fixed. We don't waver this way or that way. Or, so that takes a little time. But if we, if we take um, shelter of the temple and the processes of devotional service and gradually we could become f really fixed up to the point where we don't waver um, so that's the idea but the test that we fell in um, that's good in the sense because we know where we need to work on what we need to work on just like a teacher may test the student and then based on the student's um, performance, their, their failures and their success, the teacher knows exactly their strong and weak points. Um, they know where the student needs to improve and they know where the student's doing very good and what subject they're doing very good in. So similarly, we may be tested and we can look at it like that, that all right, I'm being tested here, and now I know exactly what my weak points are, and I know exactly what my strong points are. And then, knowing our weak points and our strong points, we could focus on trying to make our weak points strong and our strong points stronger, right? Um, so sometimes somebody's weak point may be anger, or um, whatever. There's so many different things, different weak points. So, and that's what illusion tries to do. They say, she, she, okay, can't get you this way, can't get you that way. Okay, I could get him this way, right? Like we were discussing that the other day. 
I can't get him this way, this way, this way. Okay, I can get him on pride. Right. All right, I got him. So, but it's the business of the devotee to be introspective and to know their weak points. And therefore, to be very careful in their interactions and dealings. Like, for example, if their weak point is anger and they know that by associating with a particular devotee or particular devotees that they may become angry, they should stay away. Or if they know their weak point is when they walk by, when they go on Garnet and they walk by the bar, they have a strong urge to go on and drink. Maybe they should not go on Harnam and Garnet. Maybe they should stay back and do something else. Just like an alcoholic, they stay away from the bar. It means somebody who's a recovering alcoholic. They stay away from the bar because that's their weak point. So, um, and also we should never feel ourselves free. Like, okay, I'm free now. Like I've, because, I mean, because uh, even though one may be strong in many ways, if they have a little weak point, then, you know, they could, Maya could infiltrate there and just cause havoc. So we always want to be uh, careful on guard, right? Vigilance is the price of freedom, they say. One's. So we want to be vigilant. So, yeah. Does anybody have any other uh, comments? Hare Krishna Prabhu, I just want to let you know there is one question pending on the Zoom. I want to hear a question from you, Tapas. All right, any uh, other in-house questions? Dimitri? Comments? Dimitri is going to distribute a Srimad Bhagavatam set on the street soon. All right. We'll see. Okay, so Zoom, you could ask. Yes, uh, Balaram Prabhu, uh, Dandabad Pranams. My question is, what is the most obvious sign of a non of a non devotee, if there is any? Okay. Um, very uh, uh, obvious sign of a non devotee. The, the most obvious, if there is a most obvious one. Most obvious. Well, I mean, it's, it's because non-devotees, I mean, there's different types of non-devotees. I mean, there's Mayavadis, they're non-devotees, there's... Um, there's regular karmis, they're non-devotees. So there's different, you could say, classes of non-devotees. So you could say that every class has their own unique, special feature that you could say is maybe more prominent. Like, for example, there may be many non-devotees who are very nice, at least from external appearance. They're, like Srila Prophet would say, <laughs> modern people <laughs> he said they think that by having nice clothes and by washing their body very nicely and having a nice apartment that oh we're very civilized right but he said well what is their consciousness because so what you know you could you could also bathe a dog very nicely and dress them very nicely and let them live in an apartment right <laughs> but the consciousness is what's supposed to determine. So the thing is, like there's like no, some non-devotees, like in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that they're like super demoniac. I mean, there's all these uh, qualities, and you, like Hiranyakashipu, for example, we're coming under Singadev's appearance. I mean, he's like right the Asurya, what is it called? So, uh, best of the demons, right? So, but he, anybody can look at him and say, oh, he's clearly a demon, right? He's clearly a non-devotee. But what I'm saying is that there's some non-devotees that, you know, they're, they're philanthropists. <laughs> they're, you know, very well-spoken um, in what, the, you know, what, their communication. 
Uh, there may be very, they may be vegetarians, right? Like Hitler, I think, was also vegetarian. So, anyways, but so in other words, it may not be so um, so obvious their bad qualities. But you could say the overriding main quality of all non devotees is that they're just not interested in Krishna. They're just not interested for this reason or that reason. Like, there, there, there may be so many reasons they're not interested, but they're just not interested. I think Vijay Prabhu has something. Prabhupada said the most prominent symptom of a non devotee, they speak nonsense. <laughs> All right, that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> that's very uh, concise. The most prominent uh, feature of a non devotee is they speak nonsense. So that's the thing. You can't tell who's a devotee and who's, who's a non-devotee. Yeah, you could say that. You can't tell one of the things and, and tell that you hear them speak. And you say, wow, this person's, this person's a real, real devotee. You think, oh, this person's really in Maya. Or as Prabhupada said, what will a goat not eat and a madman not say? So they say so many things. Thank you. All right, well, I hope that satisfied you. Yes, very much. Uh, and if I may, I liked it when you said that Hitler was a vegetarian, but he was not obviously a devotee. Yeah. At least that's what some say. Oh. Yeah, there's some question whether he was actual vegetarian. I mean, I, I know he had a, who knows, I mean, who knows, all this historical accounts and what he, what he really stood for. And of course he wrote that book. He wrote a book, but that tells a lot. He was a dog owner. Um, anyway, so any last? Nothing? Okay. All right. Ooh, I have a question. Uh, I saw that Lord Shiva is praying to Lord Shankarshan, so... As guessing what could be the hierarchy of Lord Shankarshan incarnation from Krishna? The hierarchy? Yeah. Um, what do you mean by hierarchy? Uh, how the Shankarshan is coming from Lord Krishna? Can you explain oh. that? Well, what is it? There's Krishna, and then he, he comes as Anirudha and expands to Pradyumna, Anirudha, uh, Sankarshan, and who else? The Chaturvyuha. So there's all this, you know, Krishna and then different forms coming from Krishna. So, yeah, I mean, that's, we were discussing that the other day, and I think that will be discussed more throughout the chapter, but... Um, yeah, as mentioned, um, these different forms of Krishna, they appear for different reasons. Just like Ram Chandra, he came for a particular reason, Matsya, Korma, Varaha. So they're all coming for different reasons. So similarly, Sankarshan, Anirudha, all these different expansions of Krishna, they're coming for different reasons. Um, yeah. So, all right. Okay, so we'll stop there. Thank you. Grantaraj Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.